Greetings, fellow football managers, and welcome to the subject of my dreams. Joking aside, this is a little schedule of a new save that I've started off to take advantage of the 24.3 database update that dropped a few weeks ago. But also when Liverpool play badly, I tend to start a new game just to get my frustration out. Now, as you can see, these results are pretty good, but the reason I'm pulling this screen up is these two particular results over here. Tottenham away 2-2, and then Manchester City at home 2-0. Now, let's go to the Tottenham game first. And if we have a look at the story of the game, you can see that Tottenham were probably a little bit lucky to actually have got the equalizer. They got it quite late and they didn't really deserve it. If we look at that second half, as you can see, I'm the dominant team there, generated a lot better XG, two really big chances, a couple of chances at the end as well where we should have scored. We didn't say la vie. That feels a bit on brand for Liverpool right now, creating chances and not scoring goals, aside from penalties. I find Tottenham away a really tough game because I feel as if some of their players are overrated. Look at this guy, Pedro Porro. You tell me in the comments if you want, is he that good? Passing 16, vision 15, massive physicals, very, very good at crossing, mentals good all over the place, maybe aside from a little bit of composure concentration. Is he that good? Anyway, that's beside the point. But what's really interesting is Tottenham's tactics because you have Pedro Porro and then Udogi off the left-hand side both coming in as inverted wingbacks or inverted fullbacks and they do kind of play like a 2-3-5 or a 3-2-5 or something like that. So those tactics are all about the build-up. We looked at build-up in my last video and they do tend to stifle you. They get control of the game if you're not careful, if you don't really counter them. To be fair, Liverpool is a good team and just by player stats alone, they should do a good job against Tottenham and they did, but you still need a little bit of tactical nows to be able to get past that intricate kind of play that Tottenham do. Let's look at this Manchester City game now. This is a little bit more indicative. Look at the stats. Liverpool have generated 1.49 XG, but only 39% possession. Manchester City, meanwhile, 0.19 XG in 61% possession. If we look at the match story, look at that. City have almost done nothing. And even though they had only 0.19 XG, that has come in very, very small fractions. It's not like one chance of 0.19 XG, which could be a goal, but it's just been little chips and nibbles. Whereas we have generated a couple of really big chances, a couple of decent chances, and we've taken the goals when they've shown up. So even though this was at Anfield, how on earth did we do this to Manchester City? To be honest, this video was inspired a little bit by the real-life events of this week. We obviously had European competition. We had Manchester City lose against Real Madrid, which was a very interesting study in defending, especially the second leg from Real Madrid. They essentially played a low block. They kind of defended their goal. They allowed Manchester City onto the edge of the box and then stopped them there, aside from one chance, which kind of fortuitously came to Kevin De Bruyne, and he was able to finish really well. Outside of that, though, Real Madrid actually blocked with a front four. They also did one very, very interesting thing, which 4-4-2's Adam Cleary covered really well. I encourage you to go and watch that video. It was a very nice look at exactly what Real Madrid were thinking in that back area. And that is something we can translate into Football Manager as well. Atalanta Liverpool, meanwhile, was a little bit different. Let me just try and show you what I saw from that game. Liverpool kind of lined up a little bit like this. You had Luis Diaz instead of Nunez, obviously, and Gakpo and Diaz were kind of interchanging up front there. So one of them was on the left wing, the other one came into the striker position. Salah went very, very central. Far more central than I've ever really seen him, especially in the first half. Now, what did Liverpool really do? They had Trent Alexander-Arnold as an inverted wingback support. That's kind of what he does. Dominic Soboslai was something like a Mezala attack or support, not quite sure. And Salah was kind of an inverted winger or an inside forward. So most of their joy came from those three. The goal came as well from Alexander-Arnold getting to this kind of position and winning a penalty. Liverpool got joy in that first half mostly thanks to Dominic Soboslai and his ability to run and his willingness to run into weird positions. Like he was running into this Salah position a lot, he was running here a lot, and then Salah was moving inside really far in to try and make space for Soboslai. So that's one of Liverpool's movement patterns which they use quite a lot and that is obviously something you can generate in Football Manager with this kind of setup, although the duties might change. This might be attack, this might be support, for example. But the point is, the in-to-out and the out-to-in movements were key in that first half. 
What happened in the second half is Liverpool made a couple of changes. There wasn't as much movement. At some point, Trent came off and then the passing range from the back dropped off a cliff. So in that second half, especially Atalanta, were able to shut Liverpool down to something like two shots. And all of the ball was being held by Alisson. That was because Atalanta were man-marking Liverpool in this kind of area. What you need to try and imagine is dropping the opposition formation on top of your own. So the first way to shut down opposition build-up play and prevent them from getting through you is to actually mirror their formation in a certain way. So Atalanta would have played something like this. They would have had a back three, essentially. Then they would have had two wingbacks. And then they would have had kind of a narrow front three. I would say something of this sort. This was kind of the thing with that big target man, the former West Ham guy, in this position on top of Konate. So essentially, he man-marked Konate. You had the other guy stuck on Van Dijk. And then you had the attacking midfielder, I think it was Coop Mainers, on top of McAllister, the DM. So this was man for man in the center over there. Then they had their wingbacks pushing up very quickly to press the Liverpool fullbacks. And these two central midfielders were man-marking Liverpool. So if you look at this, it is right on top. You have that front three over there, the wingbacks coming down here, and then these two guys getting man-marked. So that is the kind of thing we can do in Football Manager as well, but it's a little bit tricky. The trickiest part is getting your wingbacks to man-mark the opposition fullbacks because there's so much distance for them to cover. This is where if you really want to play to disrupt rather than play your own game, you might actually try and put them somewhere here. You might put them as defensive wingers or something like that. Change the role here, go to defensive winger, support. That will make it a little bit easier for them to do that job. Because then you're trusting your back three to go up against the opposition's front three. These three guys are then going to be picked up by these three guys. That's kind of how it works. And then these guys will man mark and these guys will man mark as well. Now, this is something I don't do going into the game. This is something I change within the game. But again, if you're planning from the outset, you might actually set up something like this going into the game. And if you play against a lot of 4-3-3s and 4-2-3-1s and stuff like that, you might actually just want to have this setup ready to go. That being said, you don't have to create these funky fighter plane formations. You can. You can obviously have something like this. I don't think this is a bad idea at all to just have it trained up that you can switch into. But you can absolutely do it from a base like this one. So if you're going to go into the game to actually do this, if you're going to stifle, this is the kind of screen you want. My next game is up against Chelsea, so I'm looking at the Chelsea opposition report. Now, this screen doesn't actually tell me that much. It's a little bit blah, blah. The real secret source comes at the bottom right over here. To wit, the analyst report and then the scout report. The full opposition report is cool too, but I go to the analyst report first because this gives you a little bit of information. Not much information. This is kind of sparse. It's also telling you what formations they're using. You're looking at a 4-2-3-1 DMAM wide. Basically, this thing over here, they've also used a 4-3-3 DM wide. Okay. 89% of the time though, they've been in this formation. So now if I'm planning to stifle them from the start... I know I need to try and match up against this formation. That probably means I need a DM and I need three at the back at least. So when we go into the tactics screen, I'm kind of going to want something like this to go ahead. Again, I'm not saying go with this formation, but in my regular formation, I might pick this one with the DM if I had an alternative of this. If these were my two formations that I have normally trained up, I might start with this one because this has the DM to go up against their AM. That is a big one. If you allow their AM space in here, he will hurt you because generally speaking, you're playing against good players and AMs tend to have high passing, high vision, high movement, high finishing, all of that kind of thing, and they can kill you. That's why you have a DM and sometimes two DMs. So the next thing we can learn from the opposition report is what? Actually, not much from the analyst report, but we can have a look at their scout report. The scout report is interesting. It gives you the best 11. So this is kind of your worst case situation. Obviously, a couple of players could change things up a little bit. But generally speaking, if they had their first 11 in, this is what it would look like. And as we can see, through ball assist makes a lot of sense because they have nobody crossing. There is not a single player here who would cross a ball, except maybe the IFB really late in an attacking move, 
or maybe the advance forward early on in an attacking move. Maybe. Generally, though, you're looking at through ball assists from Sterling, from Jackson, from Palmer. Enzo Fernandez will jump up from that area to become the fifth man in attack. Nonsi over here looks like he'll get into a double pivot with Caicedo, but if he's on support, he might get a little bit beyond. And then you have James tucking in to make it a back three. So this is going to be a back three with these guys. Then you're going to have the two over here. And then Fernandez will jump up to finish the attacking five. Looks to me like a left side, or at least Sterling, would be the inside forward attack. And Jackson is the inside forward support, probably. Looks also like Palmer is on a supporting duty, just by the alignment of these boxes. So how are we going to deal with Chelsea? So what's going to happen here is quite interesting. If we go man for man, we'll have our left-sided forward on top of Reese James. We'll have our right-sided forward on top of Thiago Silva. We would have our central forward on top of Chaloba over here. Then when Chilwell gets up there, we would have our right-sided central midfielder on top of him, left-sided central midfielder on top of him. And then we would have our DM getting done by both of these players because our DM would naturally be, you know, marshaled by Palmer. But then Enzo would go in and become the free man. So that for me is really risky because going man for man like that, especially right at the bottom on top of their buildup, is really, really tricky because of Enzo coming up there and then going two for one on top of our DM. That is why this 4-2-3-1 deep kind of thing without the CMs but having two DMs, that is why this formation has been so effective in Football Manager 24. It's because of the ability of one of the DMs to get up there and join attack. That can be really tough to deal with, especially in a man-marking kind of system. If you look at the top here, one of your centre-backs will be on top of Nkunku. You'd have your right back on top of Sterling, left back on top of Jackson. And then one centre-back would be free to pick up Palmer as he gets through. But then when Nkunku goes side to side, he will occupy both the centre-backs, giving Palmer space. And then Fernandez will come in there and overload, letting Palmer make runs into the box. So that's why a lot of Chelsea's chances are coming through that area, because that is their key strength if going up against a man-for-man -man system. So how am I going to deal with something like this? Essentially, I need to look at this formation and see where is the free man. This is something that Real Madrid did against Manchester City, where Real Madrid essentially designated Manuel Akanji, who was Manchester City's libero. He was the free man. So Real actually let him walk up all the way here and play ball without being man-marked. And he was only kind of pressed once he actually got into the box. Aside from that, he was pretty much unmarked for that game. So they've looked at him and decided, okay, you can't really hurt us. So that is something that you can do as well. You can kind of decide who is the free man going to be. As we said, if this formation goes up against my 4-3-3, the free man will be Enzo Fernandez, which is really, really nasty. We don't want one of their creative central midfielders. I think he's creative. Yeah, passing 16, vision 17. Do you want that guy as your free man? I think not. So in this case, I need to decide that either probably Thiago Silva, Trevor Chaloba, or Reese James, one of those guys, or their equivalent players, is going to be the free man. And therefore, I probably will not go for an advanced man marking system. If I do, I will do it like this. So this is generally something that I would do in game because I kind of have a feel for it already. Again, I would do it in full match, kind of near the start of the game. But I would go to these different positions and then design the marking setup with the idea of their formation. So I'm going to try and kind of overlay their formation here. So they've got that back four, then they've got the two midfielders, then they've got the three up here with the one over here against the DM. So I've got that overlay in my mind and then I'll start setting things up. For example, this is Reese James' position. We know he's an inverted fullback, so we're going to set this guy to mark specific player, Reese James. Chelsea's our next game, so Chelsea will be the option over here. I can then go mark tighter as well. So if Reese James gets forward, he will get marked up by Luis Diaz. Mark tighter also means that he might not be as available for a pass. I'm okay with that, with Reese James not getting on the ball. So cool. Mark tighter, done. So that is Reese James man marked. The big question here is what do I do on the right hand side? Right now this is Gakpo, normally this is Salah, so let's switch Salah over there. What do I do with Nonsi? Nonsi was an inverted wing back, probably support. So he's going to come down into Enzo's position. If we just look at that once more, go to scout report. This guy over here, as Enzo goes up as a volante, this guy will come in here. So what do we do with him? Do we just let him go? 
or do we man mark him into that position? As we said, we don't want Enzo being the free man. So I actually want my midfielder to take care of Enzo. And therefore, I'm actually going to set Salah to man mark Nonsi. Here we go. Man mark, and this time definitely mark Tider because he's on an attack duty and that guy's getting forward. So if you don't really set Mark Tider, there's a risk that he doesn't actually mark him. Because again, his mentality is attacking, not defending or something like that. So you need to be a little bit stricter with your attacking players by setting things like Mark Tider if you want them to track their runners. So what we've done there is we've taken care of Chelsea's two fullbacks, which means their center backs are going to be left to one man. Our striker is going to have to deal with their center backs. Now, again, if it was City and you had a libero coming out, you could probably set one of your midfielders to man mark that libero. That's what I did in that 2-0 against Manchester City. I had my left attacking central midfielder man marking City's libero. And I had my striker sitting on top of, I think, Gvadiol and their other central midfielder, whoever that was. So I had my striker going up against two. So in this case as well, I would rather let Gakpo go against the two players there than leaving free men coming in. So Sobos life, for example, we are going to take him. We're going to go Mark Tider, And we are going to actually man Mark Enzo Fernandez. We know that he's going to be the one who's driving in from Volante. So he's going to be doing that. Jones, we know, is going to be man marking Caicedo. So we can set that up. To be honest, that one isn't as essential, I would think. I may even leave that one off because Jones is on an attacking duty. Caicedo's on a defensive duty. I'm not worried about Caicedo hurting me that much. So it's not like he's going to be ignored if I don't set this up. But I could still set this up to prevent him getting on the ball and then progressing the ball into the midfield line. This guy, meanwhile, is going to be on top of Palmer wherever he goes. And in this case, Palmer is not set to be on the field. So it's Nkunku who is the attacking midfielder center. So we could just go AMC, mark the AMC tight. We could do it like that as well for a more generalistic kind of thing. If they swap positions, for example, we can do that. So now what I've done is I've left them the free man over there in defense. And I've actually gone four on three over here because my DM is going to take care of their AM and my four defenders are going to be up against their three attackers. So that for me is fine, especially given the fact that Robertson is going to be going up the flank and sometimes unavailable. So it should then be a three on three or a four on four. So right now with this specific man marking kind of situation, I feel very confident that I've limited Chelsea's ability to play through my team. And I also haven't given up the structural integrity of my formation to try and design some kind of formation like this where I'm countering them. I don't have to do this for Chelsea. Would I do it for Manchester City away? Maybe not because I'm a hardhead and I feel like I can do it from a 4-3-3. That's why 4-3-3 is one of the best basic formations because it can kind of do anything. It can take care of almost anything, including the 4-2-3-1. But if you don't set up this kind of manual marking system and you have these inverted wingbacks and inverted fullbacks and volantes and stuff like that, you can kind of get overloaded. And Chelsea's game, as we saw, was to overload RDM. So we can just use the Mark Titer instruction and Mark specific players to shut down the opposition's buildup. When we saw Gasparini play Liverpool last night, Allison had something like 106 touches and he had 80 something passes, which was absolutely insane for a keeper. But that was because Gasparini made his team man mark the hell out of Liverpool. They had a five on five over here, as we saw the three here. And then these two guys getting man marked by the wingbacks. And they had a marking system on these two guys. So you can set up that as well. And then they had man for man on this area too. And Alisson was allowed to be the free man. So in terms of Real Madrid against City, Manuel Akanji was allowed to be the free man. In Liverpool, Atlanta, Alisson was allowed to be the free man. And in that game, you could kind of see what Liverpool were trying to do. They were trying to invite the press on Alisson to then find the free unmarked player. And it was generally Scamacha who was jumping away from Konate in this position over here. And then Alisson was trying to give him the ball. Problem there was Konate is kind of Liverpool's weakest on-the-ball player. And therefore, that didn't really hurt 
Atalanta very much. If Liverpool had tried to get Van Dijk on the ball, if Alisson had kind of gone a little bit more to the left and drawn the press from Van Dijk's marker, that could have been maybe a little bit more interesting. But they did get Robertson on the ball quite a lot as well. But again, Robertson couldn't do very much. And when Trent Alexander-Arnold came off, the game was basically over. So if you want to double down on that kind of thing and make sure that your players don't press the Alisson in this example, you can go up into opposition instructions and start tweaking things like that. Now, tight marking we've already done with this specific kind of thing. You can do this in-game too. I'm not a huge fan of tight marking in-game because I'd rather do something specific and have specific players follow other players. But trigger press is an interesting one. So you might go and say, Robert Sanchez, never press him because he's not going to do anything with the ball. He's got vision 11, passing 11. To be fair, his kicking is 15, but his vision is so poor that he probably isn't going to hurt us very much if he gets on the ball. On the other hand, when you're playing Manchester City and it's Edison on the ball, I don't know how they manage it, but I'm pretty sure Edison has 20 vision. Let's have a look at him. Okay, not 20, but that's still passing 18 vision 17. That's insane. And kicking 20, obviously. So this guy might be the kind of goalkeeper you press frantically, but still with his 20 composure, he isn't too bothered by a press. So incredible once in a lifetime kind of player this guy point was though we were looking at opposition instructions and you can kind of go for a never press as an interesting thing to make sure that your marking system stands because again when you have your tactics set up you need to be a little bit aware of what's going on here trigger press more often means that your players will jump out of position a little bit and sometimes leave their marker to press other players so you need to be a little bit careful with that when you're playing a marking kind of game. Now, I'm not going to remove this because I do want my players to jump in and press when available. I'm just trying to restrict Chelsea's build-up in the next game. I'm not trying to shut them down completely. If I was going to try and shut them down completely and play for the nil-nil or the 1-0 or the 1-1 one -one or whatever, I might drop the pressing down just to make sure that my marking structure stays but in this case, I'm not going to do it because of the situation of the game. But that is, again, a change that I would consider making in this situation. Showing onto foot is also another one. If you want to get really granular, you can actually try and do that. For example, Reese James. You know that Nicholas Jackson is taken care of. You know that Fernandez is taken care of. By the way, in this screen... We have Caicedo on the left-hand side and Fernandez on the right-hand side. So that is something you need to think about a little bit. And that's why I said I do most of this stuff in-game, not before the game. Because then I can see what the situation really is. And the switch of central midfielders like this is a big one. This is something you need to be really wary about. So again, if it's a tough game, if you're putting so much energy into going into a game like this you probably want to do full match anyway for at least a little bit just to make sure your plan is good so going back to that example reese james pushing him outside might be a good idea especially if fernandez is a volante because then fernandez will probably be a little bit further up jackson should be quite far up and kunku is far away so then pushing james onto his right foot will actually make him look down the line a little bit more and prevent him from going back in Remember, Thiago Silva and Dizazi, one of those two guys was going to be our free man. So we would want James to look outside then. So pushing James onto his right foot might be an interesting option you could think of. And pushing the goalkeeper onto a certain foot might be an interesting one as well. If you want to give them the free man. So I have kind of a pressing trap in a sense because we've given them the free man with one of these two. So if you want him to look for the short pass, you could maybe push him onto his right-hand side, show him onto his right foot, because then he'll get all of these three short passing options. Whereas on his left foot, he might have fewer options since Nancy will probably be going a little bit further forward. So there's all these things you can kind of think about doing to counter an opposition's build-up structure. I'm not going to go into the game and actually show you how this might play out because I would have to make more changes in-game based on what Chelsea actually do. But I hope this has given you an idea of how you can actually think about what you're seeing on the field. Click that full match button. Watch how the opposition players move, what their roles are. After a few minutes in game, your staff should give you an idea about what their roles are. If you can't already see it on the field from watching in full match for a little bit, watching you know one or two of their build-up moves and seeing where the players go and what they do should give you an idea about those roles. And then you can chop and change your specific marking system, design it 
to counter what they're doing or to give them a free man, design a couple of traps like that, go man for man across the whole pitch if you want to, like Atalanta did, that can definitely work too. What I did against Manchester City, for example, I gave them the free man in their defense and was able to press them and score a couple of goals with that. Do what works for you. But this specific marking system is, I think, something that everybody needs to know about. If you didn't already use it, this is something you can do in the game and it can bring you huge benefits, especially given the roles in the match engine now. Things like Mazalas, inverted forwards, inside forwards, inverted wingbacks, inverted fullbacks, all of these things which are moving laterally and horizontally, which your base formation just may struggle to match in the match engine. What we can do against that is by setting specific marking. Hope you've enjoyed this. As always, I will talk to you in the comments below.